Thank you so much. You know, it's, it's, it's always such... You know, when, every, when every, every speaker comes up here, they give so much of themselves, and we just have to appreciate that, please. So it's not just a round of applause because it's the right thing to do. It's because there's so much that goes into doing something like this. And we want to say thank you so much to all of our speakers and those coming after. Thank you so much from the depth of our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, the platform today, is Dr. Sam Amadi. Let's appreciate him. Dr. Sam is the former chairman of the Nigerian Electricity Regulation Com Regulatory Commission. He is a fellow of the Care Center of Government. Until 2010, Dr. Madi had held the of Senior Special Advisor to Nigeria Senate President, Director of the Center of Public Policy and Research in Lagos, amongst others. He was chairman Senate Technical Committee on the Review of Competition and Consumer Protection Commission Bill in February 2017, and the chair Senate Technical Committee on the Review of Transportation Sector Reform Bill from March to June 2017. Dr. Amadi is a lawyer and a member of the Nigerian Bar Association. He was a senior counsel at the Ghani Fawaemi Chambers from 1993 to 1995. And in 1995, he became an associate in Olisa Agbakoba Associates and was also a part of the defense counsel to Ken Sarawiwa, a renowned author and environmentalist who was killed by the Nigerian military at the time. Dr. Amadi holds both doctorate and master's degrees in law from Harvard Law School and a master's in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School of, Gov of Government. He attended University of Calabar where he got his bachelor's degree back in, in 1992 and afterwards attended the Nigerian Law School in 1993. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the platform Dr. Sam Amadi. Thank you. It's an honor for me and privilege uh, to be invited here. I thought I would be the last, but then I'm, I've been deprived the honor of being the last to speak because I've seen my friend Kule and, of course, Lekki coming. Uh, I've been personally enriched by discussions going on here this morning. I have, um, like, what do people say? Teach, make I teach, name the text I be. So I've learned more by listening both to the embodied spirits here with us, self acclaimed as a more, <laughs> and of course, uh, the aristocrats, intellectuals, prof himself, and ordinary me. I'd I like to quickly say that my perspective is more critical and not motivational. I Pastor set us up by saying uh, a better Nigeria. And I, I started thinking around it. First, and of course, Professor uh, Prof said, failed, failing, or distressed country. So first is, what is Nigeria? Is Nigeria a failed country, a failing country, or distressed? Uh, the topologies and what constitutes each of them is well known. So if you are critical, you will say probably a failed country because uh, if you look for Abuja, going to Kaduna, it's probably one of the few capitals in the world. We are 200 meters from where the present sits. Even with military escort, you can't travel 200 away from that city, from the capital. So evidence of failure, state failure, loss of territory, one can argue. Or you can say failing. But howsoever, we have to decide uh, make up our mind, whether it's failing or failed, it's still something of concern. That's why we're here. Now, the second issue that imply is kind of, we can tease out from the framing of today's discussion, is what we want, a better or a new Nigeria. Now, 
better Nigeria suggests some incrementalism, and that has been uh, the approach of technocrats, technicians who fix things, okay? So if you are like my friend, Ezemo, if you are from the <laughs> development uh, community, you will speak more around um, better Nigeria, which means incrementalism. We're going to, things are moving, things are not too bad. We can optimize here, optimize there, we can tweak here, tweak there. We have better schools, ASU shouldn't be on strike for seven months, but you're not talking about maybe radical reconceptualization of a country or of a society. So that is incrementalism and nothing bad about it. But of course, you can talk about radical change, which means you are, if you're talking about radical change, you're talking about maybe less than routine diagnosis of the problem. So, I start from the premise that Nigeria's malfunctioning and serial failure. Nigeria has several opportunities and times to restart itself, restart development, but keep failing. I take the first view that there must be something structurally and normatively wrong about Nigeria that explains these failures. And in my many years of studying, I am somebody who, uh, on Wednesday, I, I wrote a uh, back page on Shegu's paper, and I argued that Nigeria has economic crisis is a function, or it can be explained by what I call incoherence. I believe the theory of incoherence, that part of the problem we have is that our systems are incoherent. And I give a simple example. If you want to build a meritocratic society, and at the same time, you provide more of patronage and prerogatives. That's incoherent. And what we see from history of countries is that it's difficult, and this is the truth, for any country to move from failure to success. And that's the reason why you can't point to three or five countries in the world in the 21st century that has exited under development. That's a part dependence to failure and to success. Because of the way institutions work, people are trapped. Institutions, they, they, they are sticky. And so if you look at, when I look at Dubai, when I look at Taiwan, you look at South Korea, China, Japan in the 21st century or 20th century, or you look at England or America, you discover that two processes play out. One is part dependence. A society continues in a part, doing some minimal reforms here and there, but sticking to the same direction, which is, of course, what science tells us. That objects remain in motion until something acts on them. Then from part dependence, you get to adaptation. Events happen, upheaval, deep moments, and leaders and society have a conversation and they start adapting. They start variation. And so I give an example that's physical. If a plane takes off from here to London and makes a slight deviation from Israel, in less than 30 minutes, it's probably going to move out of the stratosphere, maybe in the moon or so. So that deviation, if it continues, recreates a new form of society. Now, let's take a few examples quickly. I heard Ezebo talk about China. People forget that China has had over, over 200, 300 years of robust conversation about its culture and economy. But we saw two moments that have been very distinctive. Moa, Chama Moa created the Cultural Revolution, and then we saw Deng. Now, if you study China very well, there are radical changes that created what today looks for us as prosaic or routine. Societies are trapped. Nigeria is a trapped country. It needs disruption. But the question is, and this is very important, disruption does not necessarily give you the solution. Disruption creates that sense of disorder that if properly orchestrated and with craftsmen who understand how to rebuild, reconstruct, you enter into a new moment. For me then, therefore, I think that Nigeria's problem, and which a new leader, the new, leader must, new leadership, I don't want to talk about leader, leadership, should grapple with, is diagonizing what I call three fundamental, or actually four, depending on how you, 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 you categorize them, four fundamental crises of Nigeria. The first is a crisis of nationality. Who are Nigerians? Now, it looks too archaic or academic. But what you see is, each time we talk about national unity, we 
underline that we seem to be struggling to create the idea of a Nigerian nation. The, the sage Awolo spoke many years ago that Nigeria was a geographic expression. And we thought probably it's poetry, it's politics. But the point there is that and there's, nothing, um, there's no fait accompli about how nations are created. Nations come from different parts, from conquest, from assimilation, from happenstance. But what is clear is that when you become a nation state, hyphenated, there are two seemingly contradictory things you have to put together. One, nationality. Now, nations, the idea of nations suggests some kind of contiguity of ancestry, of, of, of mythology, of genealogy, of custom. People like to be with their likes. State creates a civil order built around what today we call constitutional virtues. So we talk about freedom, liberty, efficiency, production. So to be a, a nation state, you must carefully bring together though that, that seemingly ethnic dimension of identity, I'm an Igbo person, and the civic dimension of state, I'm in Nigeria, citizenship, couple them well, and that's why we have failed since 1960. So for example, if you look at a constitution, and that's the doctrine of incoherence, the constitution in section 27 talks about Nigerian citizenship and predicated to ethnic groups. It says a Nigerian citizen is somebody whose parents or grandparents came from ethnic groups indigenous to Nigeria. So we construct our citizenship, even from a constitutional point of view, from an identity of ethnicity. Many of us have dual citizenship. Some of you here are American citizens, are British citizens. They are constructed as American citizens because, not because your, your ethnic group is indigenous to the territory called America. That incoherence has frustrated not just nationality, but development, production. And I'll come to that. So the first crisis we had is a crisis of nationality. Who are we as a people? And we have a history. Prof has said that we were not Igbo Yoruba until maybe some period before the annexation or amalgamation. But the point is that the British didn't have the incentive to create us as one nation state. And that's very clear. In fact, in the letters of uh, Lord Lugard, it was clear he had a problem with going back to Westminster, or uh, yes, Liverpool, every weekend for social life. And so he considered that he wanted to have not a very intense and integrated country, but one that is loosely, so, so that you can use South to finance North, not to finance South, and have time to be in Liverpool every weekend. So Nigeria was a half-hearted creation. But it didn't have to remain so. Nigerian leaders failed to now intensify that integration. That's the first crisis. The second crisis of fundamental crisis of Nigerian state is issue of state and religion. I, I know you don't like this. Nigeria is plagued by a religious problem. It has nothing to do with the various faiths and their status. It has to do with creating a structural way to manage radical pluralism. And I give you an example. In 1957, the northern region of Nigeria set up a commission chaired by Professor Anderson of, of London University, one of the leading African uh, uh, scholars of African law. And that committee recommended that northern Nigeria should follow the example, Indonesia has come in play here, of Indonesia, of Sudan and others, and not enact public Sharia. That was a commission in fact, one of the members was the chief imam of Sudan. Great scholars. They said, no, a modern state does not require. A 1950 constitutional conference, the matter came up again. How do you structure a multi-ethnic religious society to have assurance of justice and fairness? Nigeria stuck to what I call the accommodationist form. I said, okay, we're going to have private Sharia but no public Sharia. The Constitution wrote it down. In 2000, that bargain, what I call the Nigerian bargain, was disrupted. Nigeria has to come clear and define itself whether it's a modern, secular, democratic state or a new feudal theocratic state. You can't have it both ways. And that is what's called incoherence. You define yourself as a contract is section 10, that you are, uh, you are secular, but at the same time, 
you embody in your laws, your constitution, very serious religious intermingling with state affairs. And I've argued before, even Khan leaders, I'm, I'm, I was one of their strategists. I said, Khan should fight for religious neutrality. They don't like it. Both Khan and the Islamic group don't want states to be religiously neutral. This is not about each any religion. All of them. Why? Because the benefits of streaming religion into, into politics, into statecraft, is good for leaders of various sects. But it's dangerous. Now, flash your mind around the world. Think about countries that are terrible. None of the countries that have religious groups that are equal and mainstream religion in their politics ever is stable. In fact, countries that have 100% one religion, Yemen, so cannot be stable because religion, except you are going to be a totally theocratic state, we have to find solution to religion. We have the secular approach. We have the accommodationist model of the UK. We have the German partnership arrangement where the state recognizes the right of people to, make, to, to participate in the religion, but do not allow them to color public policy. That's very important. The last crisis I consider is the crisis of productivity. And let me tell you something about production. Many of us look at the economics in terms of we want to move from consumption to production. That makes sense. But how can you move from, to production when your state order is constructed around what people get by virtue of pri privilege, prerogative, and not by what they get by virtue of work and merit? It looks like simple, but the truth is that the modern ec economy is built around certain core values. One of them is egalitarianism. They say that people are equal. Nobody, nobody should earn more than he, he, he worked for. Entrepreneurship, you create your values, you earn from them. But we have a new feeder state, and that's what Nigeria is. Nigeria is new feeder. What do I mean? Nigeria's policies reflect a penchant to privilege prerogative rather than privilege work. That's the Nigerian mode. And that's why. If you look at rural urban divide, is very clear. Uh, Claude Ake talks, talks in terms of disarticulation of the economy, meaning if you go to Nigeria across all Nigerian states, you see that the urban area will have GRAs. Is that not correct? The GRAs are still maintained. They will have the slum. Lagos is a great experiment. Great work has done. But if you see socioeconomic imbalance, even in Lagos, the best of Nigeria, you see that sense in which public policy is actually elitist and neo feudal either pandering to religious authority or local authorities. Productivity is gained when a country defines itself on two levels, egalitarianism. It's not about what you say, it's about what you do. And secondly, meritocracy, that you have a commitment to the value of work and excellence. Here today we talked about Singapore, we talked about South Korean orders. Now, let me show you an example. I, I do a lot of study on economic development, and I ask myself, what are the key principles that underline successful economic development? And what I see everywhere is deliberate state practice to redistribute opportunities so that everybody has opportunity to engage productively. Let's take, for example, agriculture, which is the priority of all the parties in this election. If you look at South Korea, South Korea embarked on massive land reform, freed the, the people who are tied to feudal system from, gave them the land, gave them resources to create their own livelihood and build up from agrarian revolution into industrial takeoff and into where they are today as an innovation economy. If you go to China, using the town and village enterprise system, they helped rural communities to recreate wealth and opportunity by freeing them from slavery to feudal systems. But look at the Nigerian system of agriculture. We focus more on the big farmers and not on smallholders in rural communities. So the land tenure crisis is not just about federal government federalizing land. It's also about free land resources in a way that people, ordinary people, can have access to land and resources and capital. A bit of the work that financial gurus do with uh, credits and transfers to poor people are the same Nigerian avoidance of radical change. We need to disrupt by recreating a society where people have a sense of ownership. Let me begin 
to end by looking at our constitution. If you look at the constitution very well, Nigeria was the first country in Commonwealth Africa to adopt a Bill of Rights. First country in 1959, 1960. Our Bill of Rights is almost exact language as the European Convention of Human Rights. But all straight practices have diverted away from the implication of that bill. If you look at chapter, chapter two of the Constitution, it talks about an egalitarian social order. But today, part of the crisis of development in Nigeria is that the many people are cut off from meaningful existence. And Oxfam gave us some lead on what is responsible. They said three things. One, they said look at the budget of Nigeria. The budget allocations serve elitist interests and not addressed to issues of socioeconomic well-being of the people. Now, my point in today's platform is to say that this misallocation is not a functional technical error. It's a normative foundational crisis because it relates to Nigeria's conception as a neo-feudal, neo-patrimonial state, a state constructed to serve interests of those who are powerful in religion or ethnicity. So when you look at our budget, that's number one. It says number two, Nigeria has also destroyed social protection for the people. So our constitution says these rights are not enforceable. Nobody makes laws to create job tenure for people. Minimum wage is a question, I mean 30,000 in Nigeria, and still they can't pay. So if you look at poverty and disempowerment, you locate it in a deliberate, elitist allocation of resources that Panda to that conception of Nigeria's state, not as a modern democratic state. And so my message is that the new leadership must do three things now. I study strategy, and in strategy, you first do a diagnosis. If you get diagnosis wrong, you can't get it right. So a diagnosis is a narrative of relevant facts. If I look at this room, and I see that we're not properly, something's wrong about this room, maybe the sound system, maybe the arrangement, I have to pick a crux. What's the real problem in this room? With that problem, you create directing policy. Then that informs coherent set of action. So I would ask Nigerian politicians who are running for election, the leaders who emerge, to take time to diagnose Nigerian problem. Not from the technical superficial symptoms, but the underlying problem that Nigeria has consistently evaded to solve since 1960. For example, we went to war over nationality and religion. Many years after, we have not done anything to address that problem. Nigeria is a country designed for avoidance. We keep avoiding the problem. So we avoid these problems. We expect miraculously, because we are optimists, that somehow we will get it right. My own view, and I start to be corrected, is that there are only two ways I've seen in history that countries have made great change. Either an upheaval, a devastation, and they learn from it, or a strategic adaptation, moving away from where they are. And the moment we're in now is a moment of redefinition for this country. So who should be the Nigerian president? I have the name of the person here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to shock you. But I have basic attributes I think the person should have. You know, I tell people that, as a strategist, that there is no leadership is contextual. It depends on the moment you are, the leadership you need. And there have been three theories about leadership. Some say, oh, great man theory, great man making. Some people always say, oh, no, nobody makes, it's context. Some people say institution. But I think that we should look for the leader who understands. It doesn't matter the pedigree, where it's coming from. It may be a former thief who has repented. It may be a saint. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But that leader must say, that we have come to a point where we have to look at our problem and say that there's something foundationally wrong we have to fix. That admission can catalyze series of movement. It don't have to be constitutional amendment. It can start with conversations, with nuances, with programs, but let it be that it's targeted at redressing this crisis. <laughs> now, people call it visioning. People call it, you know, you have to form a vision. But the key thing is leadership matters because leaders help people learn important lessons. Leaders help people bear pains. At the point we are here in Nigeria, 
our progress forward requires realignments and relocation. Some people will lose and win. But it's leadership, credible, that would make those who are losing to accept to lose, that this pain is a common pain, and this pain is important. So we need leaders who can speak comfortable to the people and give them the assurance to be able to this pain. Totally, you need leadership that mobilizes value. Values are not what just happen. They are happenstance. That's why Nigerian police can do well in the UN, peacekeeping force, first class. In Nigeria, they are terrible. Because value is based on the relationship between leadership and structure. If people are poor, destitute, lose hope in the country, they are likely going to be corrupt in public office. To fix things, you have to restore that sense of value. And it is communicational. And unfortunately, leaders must communicate. Now, you don't have to be a, a speaker, a PhD from Oxford or Harvard or from Osaka or ABU. If a leader has a passion, he will find non-verbal ways to communicate. He will create consonance and harmony. People will see from what they do that they really are communicating the need for change. That's what our leader must do in 2023. And again, leader must build a team that can deliver. Now, there have been debates in social science around what they call the hedgehog and the fox. The fox knows many things. Hedgehog knows one grand thing. You know, when we put teams together, we think about experts, specialists in finance, specialists. But we should also look at people who have good narrative, good sense of where the country is going. We, we see people who are fixing little, little things, but they're not aligned. Those little things are not communicating a grand move from one place to another. The new leader we have must be able to bring together people who have grand vision, who also have skills to fix those very basic things. And that's why you have strategy and you have tactics. We shouldn't focus too much on all the PhDs and all the professors who are experts in narrow things. We should, we should also bring people who have capacity to envision grand things and to build pictures of where the country will go. And finally, on leadership, I think it's important that we shouldn't overinvest in elections. Political scientists tell you that elections, there are two views about elections. Oh, people say elections fix things. Others say, no, cynical view, and I support that. Elections value is that it's a credible conflict avoidance and conflict resolution mechanism. When we elect leaders through a transparent, we have resolved the question of who should rule. That's all. The next work is how do we, as a leadership collective, all of us, help solve those problems. So 2023 will not be the Nigerian revolution. It can create a disruption, but after disruption, you must construct. So we should now start preparing with narratives around competences, issues, knowledge, and begin to build a consensus. And that's why I will end by making this point very important. And I learned it from experience at NEC. When I was appointed NEC chairman, I had a, 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 an institution that was perceived to be corrupt. The former commissioners were thrown away. And the first thing I did was to identify what is priority, strategy. So the first thing is to create credibility in the system and credibility with stakeholders. And the things we did, and I discovered this is important. Nobody was persecuted. No staff was moved. Every contract, including those that were stolen, we, we, we paid the contracts. But we moved on, introduced very simple thing. We said we want to build an organization that is based on work, efficiency, and egalitarianism. And what do we do? First, I was, I'm a pastor, or, or a, 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 not as like Shegu, but a shared pastor, maybe. <laughs> I'm not a big pastor like Shegu. But you know what happened? I banned, I said nobody should pray in neck. We had a small mosque for Christians and Muslims. But all our meetings, all until I left, no prayer. When we start meeting, maybe national term, depending on if it's a formal. And interestingly, my best friend, up to today, who's the president of the Society of Engineers, who deal, was an imam. He loves me so much. He said, chairman is the best chairman. Nobody rejected the notion that nobody should pray in our meetings, including the imams and Pastor Blue Jack and other pastors in that organization. Nobody prayed. What I wanted to do was to say, look, we need to reframe our understanding that this is just a workplace. 
we still have other identities to deal with. And it worked. Corruption. We became the best, then the House of Reps, we were the best in procurement. How do we achieve it? We simply invited civil society groups to every bid opening. So they would be there, they take the results. So when my friends came and said, ah, okay, I forgot to add, I called the accountant. I said, please, come, come, come. Uh, the, the, uh, the procurement officer, I said, okay, uh, this, is my, this is my good friend, my very good friend, I beg, I beg, what can we do? So okay, we can do nothing. They have taken the list to the names of the figure who came first. Simple lesson. Because we wanted to create a new organization, we created systems that put us under limitation. We restrained our powers in a visible way. You can't run a democracy where leaders are so powerful, they can do anything, and you expect that they won't be tempted to do something wrong. If I have something to be grateful about, it's because I had commissioners who were almost disobedient, fighting me. That, that seeming that function worked well. Because everything I was doing, there was somebody who said, ah, chairman, you have power knowledge here. So please, let's not create heroes. Hero, heroism, and hero worship. Simple, functional, limited government. We are leaders, are openly accountable, and can be sanctioned and punished. <laughs> Very perfect. So if I have to conclude, I would simply say that we have to realize that, apart from God, everything is created. Poverty, prosperity, failure, success. And everything under the earth is subject to law of cause and effect. When they say whatever you sow, you reap, it's not really about when you commit sin. It's also about when you produce, organize a society. So Nigeria's failure is not fate. And Nigeria's destiny is not fate. Nigeria can be great or not. Nigeria can function or not. Nigeria can be a society, by the way, look at how we have managed in our private lives. Muslim Christians coexist peacefully. I was with Ojo uh, Madeko who went to McGill University to give a lecture. I made a point. He said, Nigeria is the only country that has the best example of religious coexistence. In one family, Muslim, Christian. No fight. Husband, wife. But in the workplace, it doesn't work. Why? Because we have not deliberately created the level of institutional framework that we have in the homes that enable it to work. In the home, everybody knows that decisions will not be based on Muslim, Christian. It will be based on the stability of the home. The fact that children need that stability to grow. In the business place, decisions will be made based on Muslim, Christian. And so we just sit and say, oh, because we, are, we marry among ourselves, we're going to necessarily have a stable political order. No. And that's why John Ross says, you have to deliberately construct a basic structure of justice. That is the argument of restructuring. Not to, I'm against geopolitical restructuring. It doesn't really matter. I, I support a restructuring based on three things. One, the principle of subsidiarity. Let lower people solve their problems. Whether it is county, whether it is district, take problems to where people live, where they have resources and competences to manage it as much as possible. Subsidiarity. And that's the base of EU framework. The second I support is reconceive the Nigerian state to be a state that does not care so much about where you come from, but cares that once you're a citizen, follow the citizen. The third and most important and the last is what I call democratic citizenship. Deliberately structure economic social activities to see people as citizens and address their needs as citizens. That's the idea of socioeconomic well-being. A state that uses every resources to cater for its citizens. And that explains why you shouldn't have a massive urban area and a slum lying beside it that needs just 20 million to free the roads. But the skyscrapers in the other side receive all the allocation. So we can be a free society, a united society, equal society, if we accept to look deeper into a crisis and have the courage to solve it. So help us God.